I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 3 for our Old Testament reading, page 256 in the Pew Bibles. This morning, we're going to read about half of that chapter, verses 1 through 25. 2 Samuel chapter 3, 1 through 25. It was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. And David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. And sons were born to David at Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoam of Jezreel. His second, Chileab of Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. The third, Absalom the son of Maacah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur, and the fourth, Adonijah, son of Haggath, the fifth, Shephatiah, son of Abitel, and the sixth, Ithream, of Eglah, David's wife. These were born to David in Hebron. While there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner was making himself strong in the house of Saul. Now Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, why have you gone into my father's concubine? Then Abner was very angry over the words of Ishbosheth and said, am I a dog's head of Judah? To this day, I keep showing steadfast love to the house of Saul, your father, to his brothers and to his friends, and have not given you into the hand of David. And yet, you charge me today with a fault concerning a woman. God do so to Abner, and more also, if I do not accomplish for David what the Lord has sworn to him, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul, and to set the throne of David over Israel and over Judah, from Dan to Beersheba. And Ishbosheth could not answer Abner another word, because he feared him. And Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf, saying, To whom does the land belong? Make your covenant with me, and behold, my hand shall be with you to bring over all Israel to you. And he said, Good, I will make a covenant with you. But one thing I require of you, that is, you shall not see my face until you first bring Michal, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. Then David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Give me my wife Michal, for whom I paid the price, the bridal price of a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And Ishbosheth went and took her from her husband, Paltiel, the son of Laish. But her husband went with her, weeping all after her all the way to Bahurim. Then Abner said to him, Go, return. And he returned. And Abner conferred with the elders of Israel, saying, For some time past, You have been seeking David as king over you. Now then, bring it about. For the Lord has promised David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. Abner also spoke to Benjamin. And then Abner went to tell David at Hebron all that that Israel and the whole house of Israel the whole house of Benjamin thought good to do. When Abner came with 20 men to David at Hebron, David made a feast for Abner and the men who were with him. And Abner said to David, I will arise and go and gather all Israel to my lord the king, that they may make a covenant with you, so that you may reign over all that your heart desires. So David sent Abner away in peace. Just then, the servants of David arrived with Joab from a raid, bringing much spoil with them. 
But Abner was not with David at Hebron, for he had sent him away, and he had gone in peace. When Joab and all his army that was with him came, it was told Joab, Abner, the son of Ner, came to the king, and he has let him go, and he has gone in peace. Then Joab went to the king and said, What have you done? Behold, Abner came to you. Why is it that you sent him away so that he is gone? You know that Abner, the son of Ner, came to deceive you and to know you're going out and you're coming in and to know all that you are doing. We'll stop there. David had been made king in Hebron, which was part of Judah. But the rest of Israel had not acknowledged him as king. The tribe of Benjamin, especially, being the tribe of Saul, would be reluctant to accept David. Abner, Saul's army commander, had thrown his support to Ishbosheth, the remaining son of Saul. But it appears that Abner may have had plans for the throne for himself. We read, Abner was making himself strong in the house of Saul. Whether Ishbosheth's accusation about Abner sleeping with Saul's concubine Rizpah was true or not, the Lord used it to bring Abner over to David's side. Abner went and he sought peace with David. He offered to do what David himself could not do. He would bring the other tribes over to be loyal to David. David made a condition for Abner to come. He must bring Michal, Saul's daughter, his former wife, with him. And we can only guess at what David's reason may have been. Did he still love Michal? Possibly. Doesn't seem likely. Did he want to remove the disgrace that he had suffered when his wife had been given to someone else? Or did he want to strengthen his position by having Saul's daughter as a wife again? We're not told what David's motives were. But Abner complied. He took Saul's daughter away from her husband and brought her to David. The husband followed along for a while, weeping, until Abner sent him back. Well, here we see how much pain people sometimes inflict on each other by their high-handedness, even the Lord's people. Abner came to David with his men, maybe 20 of them. David received him as a friend and made a covenant with him. They came to an agreement about Abner bringing the rest of the tribes over to David, and David sent Abner away in peace. But there was evil lurking in the air. Joab, who was David's nephew and commanded David's army, was not present when Abner came before David. And Joab was of a different spirit than David. When he heard that David had let Abner go in peace, he burned inwardly. Next week, we'll read the conclusion of this account. But for now, just remember, even the actions of sinful men are directed by God to fulfill his purposes. David, his chosen one, was being established as king over all Israel. Now I invite you to turn in your Bibles to our New Testament scripture reading, continuing our series on the book of Romans. This morning we are to Romans chapter 4, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 12, page 941 in the Pew Bibles. Please follow along as I read. God's holy inspired word. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? 
For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but trust him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Congregation of Christ, there are certain chapters in the Bible which are great chapters expressing spiritual truth of the highest order. And yet, some of those same chapters often present challenges when you read them. For they may contain arguments which require you to put on your thinking cap and to follow along very carefully. They require serious work. And you may not always feel like putting in the effort required to get from the text the pearl of truth that's contained in it. We're told in the Bible to crave the pure spiritual milk of the word. But not all milk of the word is the same, nor is it all easy to get at. Some of the milk of the word is more like coconut milk than like a glass of milk from a dairy cow. To get at it, you have to crack the hard shell that surrounds it. You have to get through that hard shell if you're ever going to be refreshed by the milk inside it. There's also an, another challenge that you face in hearing the word that comes from selective hearing. You've heard of selective hearing, haven't you? It usually manifests itself as hearing only what you want to hear and tuning out the rest. When I used to teach high school, some of the girls in my freshman Bible class liked using selective hearing to their advantage. Right before the class was about to begin, three or four of them would surround the podium where I was standing as I waited for the bell to ring to begin the class, and they would pepper me with questions. Do we need our book for class today? Can I go to the bathroom? I need to go to my locker. May I go to my locker? When I answered the first question, the one about needing their book for class, and said yes, two or three of them would disappear. One to the bathroom, one to her locker, and the other, I don't know where she went. Yes was the answer that they wanted to hear, even if the yes I gave wasn't an answer to their particular question. It was selective hearing. When you read the Bible with selective hearing, you tune out what you think doesn't pertain to you, and you tune into what you think does. 
Selective hearing is a danger in Bible reading, and you need to be on your guard against it. If you succumb to it, you can easily miss some of the most precious and life-changing truths of God's Word. Romans chapter 4 is one of those chapters where you have to be aware of selective hearing. For there are things in it that may cause you to think that they have nothing to do with you, and you instantly tune them out. For example, you hear that Paul's talking about Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh. And you may think, well, there goes Paul talking about the Old Testament. I'm a New Testament Christian. I'll take a little nap while Paul rambles on. Or you may start thinking, Abraham was the forefathers of the Jews, all right, but I'm not Jewish. So what Paul's talking about is probably pretty irrelevant to me in my life. And so you tune out. You tune out because you think it's irrelevant to you. But you're making a serious mistake. You've got it wrong. You think that Paul is only speaking to the Jews when he speaks of Abraham, so you stop listening. But when he gets to verse 12, where he says that Abraham is not only the father of the circumcised, that is, the Jews who are merely circumcised outwardly, Paul says that Abraham is the father of all those who walk in the footsteps of faith that Abraham had before he was circumcised. Well, that definitely applies to you. But because you tuned out at verse 1, now you've missed how Paul arrives at what he says at verse 12. And that would be a very sad thing, to miss how he got to that statement in verse 12. Because those verses between verses 1 and 12 of chapter 4 focus on things which are at the center of the message of salvation. These verses, Paul is putting his finger on what is at the heart of the gospel. When you hear Paul speaking about Abraham, our forefather, Paul is presenting a reasoned argument. And if you don't follow his argument, you'll never be able to reach the point where you rejoice in what he's saying. You have to pay attention to what he says. And not let yourself get distracted by side issues, may, which may pop up. And those will only distract you from following his main argument. And there are side issues in this passage and exegetical detours. I'm purposely avoiding most of those this morning because they, they would obscure you from understanding Paul's main argument. But if you're the kind of person who likes to talk about exegetical detours, you can talk to me afterward. I'll, I'll be glad to do that. Well, the first point that the apostle makes in these verses is this. The Old Testament scriptures teach that God credits righteousness to people through faith. Let me say it again. The Old Testament scriptures teach that God credits righteousness to people through faith. Paul's already alluded to this. In Romans 3, 21, which was part of our text last Sunday, Paul writes, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Paul is filling in something which he said at the beginning of this section dealing with justification by faith. It's likely that Paul understood that there were those, especially among the Jews, who were ready to condemn him as a preacher of new doctrine. That he was teaching things which were a departure from what the scriptures God gave in the Old Testament taught. In their minds... The way God had given so that people could be saved was by obedience to the law. Paul was saying that it was not by works of the law. And he said that in chapter 
3, verse 20. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Paul showed how the Old Testament teaches our utter sinfulness before God. None of us is righteous before God. Not a single one of us. But Paul's opponents would say that Paul had left the confines of orthodoxy and that he was teaching new and strange doctrine. So Paul is answering an attack on his doctrine. But it's how he answered it that throws light on the very nature of justification itself. What is his argument? Consider the case of Abraham. Was Abraham justified by works? If he was, he has something to boast about, but not before God. And then Paul turns to the scriptures. He quotes from Genesis 15, 6. That's verse 3 in our text. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, I want to draw your attention to that word, counted. If you look at the 12 verses of our text, you will find that it occurs eight times. It's in verses 3, 4, 5, 6, and in 8, 9, 10, and 11. The word in Greek is logizomai. And if you compare it in other translations, you'll find it rendered in a number of different ways. Counted as is one way. Reckoned as is the way some translations, like the King James, translate it. You can translate it as credited to or imputed to. I prefer credited to, hence the title of this sermon, Credited Righteousness. The word is a term people who do accounting are familiar with. If you don't do accounting, you may need a little help understanding it. So let me give you an example. It's not necessarily the best example. It doesn't explain the concept in every respect, but Try to get the main point. It's the best I could come up with. A popular commercial asked the question, what's in your wallet? And the answer is, a credit card. Or is it a debit card? A debit card takes money that you already have in your account and subtracts it from your account. That's debiting an account. A debit is a subtraction from what's there. How does a credit card work? With a credit card, there's nothing in your account to start with, unless you have a previous balance. Let's say you don't. But when you use the card, something's added to your account. What's added? Hmm the cost of the item you've charged or purchased, and interest, at least after the grace period's expired if your card has a grace period. A credit is an addition to your account. It's something that's put in that wasn't there before. With a credit card, what's added is a liability, but we don't have to worry about that. A credit is an addition. If you have a savings account, the financial institution periodically credits you your account with interest, sometimes called imputing interest to that account. That is the idea behind the Greek word logizomai. When God justifies a sinner, he credits that sinner's account. He credits it to him as righteousness. What righteousness is that? 
It's the righteousness Paul has already spoken about in verse 22 of chapter 3. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. It's the righteousness that Christ obtained for sinners when he offered himself on the cross as a propitiation for sin. That is credited to your account when you believe. Paul is saying that the Old Testament teaches that Abraham believed God, and when he did, the perfect righteousness and satisfaction of Christ was credited to his account. You see, the Old Testament does not merely predict or prophesy about the righteousness that comes by faith. That was God's way of saving people even back then, even in the Old Testament. There's only one covenant of grace under the Old Testament and in the New. People in all ages are saved in exactly the same way. There will never be another way for sinners to enter the kingdom of God but this one and only way. How does Paul prove it? By choosing two of the most illustrious persons in the history of the Jews. Abraham was justified by faith. And David recognized the blessedness of being justified by faith and wrote of it. That's Paul's first point. The Old Testament scriptures teach that God credits righteousness to people through faith. What did Abraham believe? You might say, well, he believed that God exists. <laughs> yes, he believed that. But that's not the faith that justifies. In the letter of James, it says that the demons believe that about God, but it doesn't justify them. Just the opposite. It condemns them. Well, you might say, Abraham took God at his word and obediently left Ur of the Chaldees, and he traveled to the land that God was leading him to do. Well, it, leading him to. Yeah, and it's true. He did that. But if he was justified because of that, he has something to boast of. Because then he'd be justified by what he did. So what did Abraham believe that was the means of righteousness being credited to him? He believed the promise that God had made that he would have an heir, a seed through whom he would have offspring more in number than the stars. Just read the verse that comes before in Genesis 15:5. It says, God says to Abraham, look toward the heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. And then he said, so shall your offspring be. And then we read, and he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. What did that promise mean? Was it only about having physical descendants so that he would become the father of the Jews and, and of many nations? That's not Paul's exegesis of the verse. For he writes in verses 11 and 12, you've got to skip ahead and you'll see it. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Paul sees the promise which Abraham believed as the promise of Christ, through whom all who believe on him will have righteousness credited to their account, which involves the forgiveness of sins and the perfect satisfaction of Christ. Our Lord Jesus himself 
said that this was true. In John 8, 56, we read these words. Jesus is speaking to the Jews and he says, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Don't think that God saved Abraham because he was a godly man. Abraham was a sinner, just like we're sinners. Abraham started out as an idolater. God doesn't save you because of your works. And don't think that God used to save people by the law, but now he saves them by faith. That'd be like saying your believing saves you, and then you turn your believing into a work. That does, that's not what Paul's saying either. The way God justified Abraham is the same way he justifies us, by faith. Look at verse 4. Paul saying that this crediting Abraham as righteous was a gift. It wasn't something earned as his due. When you work for someone, they pay you wages as your due. But justification, crediting righteousness to your account, the righteousness of Christ, comes as a gift. And so Paul writes in verse 5, And to the one who does not work, but who believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Now if you had stopped paying attention to what Paul was saying about Abraham, you're likely to sleep through this verse, through verse 5. And then you're going to miss something that's at the heart of the gospel. Look at that verse again. I want you to focus on these words. God justifies the ungodly. Do you see that in the middle of verse 5? He credits the righteousness of Christ to the accounts of ungodly sinners. And he does this while they are still ungodly. He doesn't sanctify them first and then justify them. He justifies them while they are ungodly. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And he imputes his righteousness and all his saving benefits of his death on the cross to us while we are still ungodly. He doesn't start to change you and sanctify you first. That comes afterward. Paul will argue later that if you've been justified, it's impossible for you to continue to go on living in sin. Sanctification is the inevitable result of justification. But they're not to be confused. The Church of Rome confuses them. It teaches that first the waters of baptism must wash away your original sin. And that enables the one baptized to begin to earn merit with God. Congruent merit is the term they use for that kind of merit. Of course, that's not enough. So God has to add to your account the merit of Christ, which is condign merit, if you're interested in what the theology of Rome calls it. Rome teaches that God has to clean you up before he justifies you, and that your sanctified good works play a role in justification. But Paul says, God justifies the ungodly. He justifies the ungodly while he is still ungodly. And then, later, he makes him godly. This is the second great truth Paul's expressing about justification in these verses. And it's really the central doctrine of the Bible. God justifies the ungodly while he is still ungodly. He credits to the sinner's account the perfect righteousness of Christ. He doesn't pour righteousness into the sinner. He imputes righteousness to the sinner's account. Paul goes on to write, it wasn't only Abraham 
who found this great truth of justification by faith. I don't understand why the translators of the ESV translated verse 1 as, what then shall we say was gained by Abraham? The word is not gained, it's found. What did Abraham find? He found that God justifies the ungodly through faith. And David also found this to be true. Paul quotes David from Psalm 32, writing of the blessedness of the man whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins are covered, the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Did you hear it? Will not count his sin. That's what the verse says. It's in the negative. But look at the words Paul puts before the quotation. What is God doing? He's crediting righteousness to the person's account, apart from works. Justification involves forgiveness, not counting a person's sins against him. But it's also crediting the perfect righteousness of Christ to the sinner. Paul said that David also discovered this great truth and wrote of it. It's the way God saves sinners. It's the Old Testament way, and it's the New Testament way. God saves sinners by justifying them through faith in Jesus Christ because of what Jesus has done. He credits the righteousness of Christ to their accounts and washes away all their sins and clothes them in the righteousness of his Son. Now, how does all this relate to circumcision? That was an important question to the Jews. The Jews glorified in circumcision. It meant that they were marked out as God's chosen people. And so we come to verses 9 to 12, where Paul brings up his third point. Here it is. The blessing of justification is not only for the Jews. It's for everyone who has the same faith as Abraham. The blessing of having righteousness credited to your account is not a blessing only for those who are circumcised to enjoy. Circumcision doesn't justify. It never has. It never will. Abraham wasn't circumcised when God credited his account with righteousness through faith in Christ. He was still uncircumcised. Paul already said that God justifies the ungodly. Circumcision isn't an instrument of justification. Faith is the sole instrument of justification. Circumcision doesn't save. Natural birth, being a citizen of a particular land or of a particular people, even if it's the Jewish people, doesn't save. Being a church member doesn't save either. And baptism doesn't save. It's a sign and it's a seal. It's very precious, but it doesn't save. Circumcision then, like baptism now, it's a sign. Paul says that in verse 11. Look at it. It's a sign, but it's also a seal of the righteousness he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. Abraham is the father of all those who believe in the promised Messiah. He's the father of the circumcised, not those who are merely circumcised outwardly, but those who walk in the footsteps of faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. And he's the father of the uncircumcised who believe on Christ. Go back to chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. 
Look what Paul wrote there. What he's saying now, he anticipated back then. Romans 2, 28, 29. For no one is a Jew who is one, merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Congregation of Christ, there is only one way for sinners to be made right with God. There has always been but one way. It's the way by which God declared Abraham righteous. And it's the way that David rejoiced in. God justifies sinners through faith in Jesus Christ. He credits to their account the perfect righteousness and satisfaction of Christ as if they had never sinned nor had been sinners. He justifies the ungodly while they are still ungodly, while they are yet sinners. And then he makes them godly. May God write this truth on our hearts. And may we believe it and hang all our hopes of heaven on it for believing it. When we do that, righteousness comes to us from Christ. It comes to all who believe. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have done for us something we could never do for ourselves in obtaining salvation and forgiveness and righteousness for us. And thank you, Lord, that you credit that righteousness to us through faith. Not because of our faith, but through faith. It's the faith you grant to us so that we can drink of the waters of life and receive them. Father in heaven, I pray that as we contemplate this this morning, I pray, Father, that its, its truths will sink down deep into our souls. I pray, Father, that those who have not put their trust and faith in, in, in you, Lord Jesus, alone for their salvation will be able to hear what your word says, Lord, and that your spirit will testify to them and that you will grant them faith to believe, Lord, so that righteousness may be credited to them. I pray, Lord, that those of us who have believed, Lord, and who do walk in the footsteps of Abraham's faith, that we also, Lord, might rejoice in this great transaction that you have caused to happen. And that we might be changed inwardly, and that we would live holy lives as a result. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gift of your Son. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your work on the cross, which is credited to us, to our accounts. And thank you, Holy Spirit of God, who creates a faith in us that we could never create, and causes us to believe in Christ so that righteousness flows to us from his grace. In your name we pray. Amen.